Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Anherid Lang. I'm the Executive Director of PHAP, that's short for the International Association of Professionals in Humanitarian Assistance and Protection, and it is my great pleasure to be once again co-hosting together with Melissa Patati from ICVA uh, this session in a new learning stream on the Humanitarian Development Peace Nexus, jointly organized by ICVA and PHAP. Great to see so many uh, both familiar names and new people joining us today. It promises to be a really uh, dynamic and interesting discussion. Um, Melissa, would you like to introduce yourself? We're actually co-hosting in two locations today, which uh, brings an interesting dynamic of its own. So over to you, Melissa. Thanks, Anherud. Um Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Pitati. I work for the ICFA NGO Network. If we're going to spell out acronyms today, I could spell out <laughs> ICFA. It's the International Council of Voluntary Agencies, a network of NGOs dedicated to principled humanitarian action. And I am joining you from Paris today. I'd like to just uh, give a little bit of background on the structure and content of today's session. Uh, we're going to explore the role of the World Bank. And uh, our particular interest in the World Bank is uh, based on an observation we've had since the World Humanitarian Summit. Um, as we've uh, talked about earlier in earlier webinars, uh, in the Grand Bargain, for example, in the New Way of Working, for example, in the Global Refugee Compact and the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework, uh, the World Bank is playing an increasing role in these policy discussions and in the, on the ground. So we wanted to learn more about that. And today we're going to hear perspectives both directly from the World Bank, as well as from NGOs working with the World Bank at the policy level and in the field. Excellent. Thanks so much, Melissa. Um, so today it's my great pleasure to welcome, as Melissa mentioned, two colleagues joining us from the World Bank, uh, Xavier de Victor, de Victor and Hannah George. Xavier will give a presentation, and then both he and Hannah will be available for questions uh, during the event. Um, following Xavier's presentation and a few questions, um, we will move to Lauren Post, working with the International Rescue Committee in Washington, D.C., and then to Thomas Jepson Lay with Save the Children in Somalia, who will both be sharing their perspectives on working with the World Bank. So now to introduce our first guest, Xavier de Victor is the advisor for the Fragility, Conflict, and Vi Violence Group at the World Bank leading work on forced displacement as a development challenge. He has broad experience across regions on country programs, strategy, and policy dialogue, most recently as country manager for Poland and the Baltic countries, and country program coordinator for Egypt, Yemen, and Djibouti. Hannah George, also joining us from the World Bank, is senior communications officer with the stakeholder engagement team in the external corporate relations vice presidency of the World Bank. In that role, among other things, she collaborates with civil society partners and leads communications and capacity building initiatives with an emphasis on programs related to governance and accountability. And I know that Hannah won't be able to stay with us for the full duration of today's event, uh, but we'll be sure to get a question or two uh, over to her before she has to depart. Um, so with that, Xavier, I will hand the floor over to you. Thank you very, very much. Um, uh, a great thank you to uh, uh, ICVA, a great thank you to uh, PAP, and a great thank you to all the organizers of this conversation. Also, a great thank you to all of you for your for your interest in uh, uh, in our work and for uh, um, sorry yeah. Uh, also, a great thank you to all of us for your for your interest in our work. Uh, what I wanted to do today was maybe just take a few minutes uh, to take you through some of the key elements of our approach to uh, to force displacement, very much with the hope that we can then have a conversation about how to um, uh, best engage together on this, um, uh, on this very important challenge. But before I go any further, um, I just would like to emphasize that this is about people. This is about people in distress, um, and it's about how we can best um, uh, support them. So from the, from the perspective of the, of the World Bank, what we see is, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to play with, uh, with the slides 
uh, your technology is 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 uh, a little bit beyond what I can master. So I'm just trying to play with the slides at the same time as I'm speaking. Um, from our perspective, false displacement is um, of uh, very high relevance to us because it it first and foremost plays out in the developing world. It's uh, it's a crisis that mainly affects developing countries. Um, about 90% of refugees uh, live in uh, low and middle income countries and the quasi-totality of um, IDPs do too. And these are the countries where we work. These are the countries where we are trying to help uh, make progress towards uh, poverty reduction and shared prosperity. When we engage as a, as a development institution, we obviously are trying not to substitute to what others are doing, but really to complement it. Uh, and from our perspective, the, the rationale for us to engage in the area of false displacement is really that uh, we see refugees, IDPs, and people living in host communities are very highly vulnerable to poverty. Uh, poverty reduction is our mandate. Uh, many refugees are poor, many IDPs are poor, many people in living in host communities are poor, and among those who uh, are not, many of them are actually very uh, vulnerable to poverty. So, so the, the rationale for engagement is really grounded in our poverty reduction mandate, and this is really um, uh, where we see it as a, as a development challenge beyond its, its humanitarian and peace dimension. But at the same time, we realize that whatever we do on the development side, um, will be successful only to the extent that other elements are being dealt with uh, successfully. And so we really see our engagement as part of a broader engagement by the uh, international community that also includes um, a security component, a peacekeeping component, a diplomatic component, a humanitarian uh, component. And, and it is only by working together that we can um, achieve success. But as part of this coalition, we really want to focus on our comparative advantage, which to us is really the, the medium term, or trying to deal with the medium term socioeconomic dimension of the crisis. And to be very uh, straightforward, when we say medium term, what we're not saying is short term emergency. Um, not because it's not important, but because we are probably not the best equipped uh, to deal with, uh, with, uh, with the emergency uh, uh, response. When we talk about the socioeconomic dimension, we're not highlighting all the dimension of the, of the situation, which are equally, if not more important, but are maybe not uh, uh, issues for which we are uh, equipped to engage. So when you, when you think about this, this um, tripartite uh, peacekeeping, uh, humanitarian development uh, uh, set of actors, um, we really see, as part of this coalition, our role as focusing on the, on the medium-term socioeconomic dimension of the, of the crisis. And it's really to have both the forcibly displaced, the refugees, the IDPs, and the, and the host communities. Uh, the other point I'd like to make is that, as a development institution, um, we typically aim to try and help countries improve their policies and consolidate their institutions. Uh, from our perspective, um, you know, in the in the 70 years or uh, uh, 70 years that we've been in existence, what we've seen is that countries that make progress towards development are, con are countries that adopt good policies and that have strong uh, institutions. And projects are a mean to that end, uh, but it's really a mean to an end. And as we enter this area of forced displacement. We also see that the key in a number of places will be about policies and institutions. It will be about whether refugees are given the right to work. It will be about whether their children can actually go to school. And so what we're really trying to do is to work with governments uh, to try to help move the agenda from one that is very restrictive to one that is much more, much more open. And we see our engagement, including our financial engagement, once again, as a mean to this end rather than as uh, uh, producing results uh, uh, of its own. Um, as we work um, as a development organization, we work, the idea is really to work under the government leadership, which means that we are here to support government. Um, the government leads the agenda, the government defines the agenda. Obviously, we engage with the government as, as they do so. Um, but our approach is really typically one where uh, we, we support uh, what the government uh, is, is doing. And so, very briefly, and we can get back to this during the, during the Q&A, um, uh, we see an agenda that's about 
uh, uh, preparedness, uh, trying to strengthen the preparation to some of these crises. That's about uh, trying to work on jobs, on education, on gender uh, during the crisis. That's about trying to move towards uh, uh, solutions. And in all this, that is trying to rely on data, on evidence, on uh, 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 rigorous learning about what works, what doesn't work, and where does it work, and where does it uh, uh, not work. All of that, of course, as you see in red, in support of a government-led uh, uh, agenda. Now, I just wanted to say a very few brief words about the financing instruments, and I'd be happy to provide more uh, uh, details during the, the Q&A. Essentially, we work through governments, right? So we provide money through governments, which governments implement pay an agreement that they have with us in terms of what they will finance, in terms of uh, who will actually be in charge of, of spending resources. Now, some governments decide, uh, or as part of this conversation, a decision is made uh, by some governments uh, to um, implement uh, everything through uh, their own institutions. In some cases, they decided to use third party uh, providers. In others, it is decided uh, to work with civil society organizations. It's really very much a case-by-case -case, uh, 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 decision based on what's best in order to achieve the development objective of the program and the development objective of the, program, of the project. Now, we have two, very briefly, we have two main instruments. One is called the Global Constitutional Financing Facility. That is uh, to, to support what we call middle-income countries, so seeing in terms of Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, uh, countries at that level of income. And we have the I-18 sub-window for refugees and host communities, which is really focused on what we call the low-income countries. Think about sub-Saharan Africa, uh, 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 Pakistan, uh, uh, and the like. Uh, the idea is really, as you see under the tag, uh, focus. The idea is really to support medium to long-term investment. So once again, it's not emergency relief. It's really medium to long-term investment. Uh, yeah, that benefit both refugees and host communities in refugee hosting countries. And there are a number of criteria that countries need to meet um, uh, to be eligible for this, uh, uh, for this financing. And once again, I'd be happy to provide more details if, if people are interested in the financing uh, aspect of that. Uh, in, in practice, um, we've been engaged in a number of countries. I'm just uh, uh, going to leave this for, 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 for a minute or so. I probably don't uh, need to. Uh, uh, go through the, uh, uh, goes through the, through the list of countries. Um, what I'd just like to emphasize that, once again, the idea is really to complement the, the humanitarian action. I think what we've seen is that the key in many cases, is, in many situations, is really to define the focus of our work, to define what it is exactly that we're trying to achieve. Assuming our programs go well, what is it that we would like to see different in five years? Um, five years is typically the sort of time frame we have in mind when we engage with uh, with the countries, maybe three, maybe eight, but this is the sort of, of time frame that, that we have in mind. Uh, I think we're also trying to work uh, closely with humanitarian, humanitarian actors. Most of you are familiar with the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework, which obviously is a very powerful framework for all of us to, uh, uh, to work together. I think the good news from our perspective is that we've seen that while we come to this from very different business cultures, very different perspectives, uh, there seems to be scope for cooperation to, um, uh, to work. And I just wanted to, to highlight the last uh, part of this slide, which is there will be an amount of learning by doing. Um, if I can be very blunt, that uh, bank speak, that the way we, we, we use English, to say not everything will work. Let's be uh, honest about expectations. This is not a magic wand. Uh, not everything will, uh, uh, will work, and therefore we also need to structure our engagement in such a manner that we can adjust as we uh, uh, move forward and also so that we can uh, learn from, uh, from failures. In terms of the approaches we take, and, and we are once again very, uh, very quickly, the question is, you know, how can we shift from crisis response to risk management, uh, from taking a, a, a very kind of, you know, responsive approach to one that manages things uh, a, a little bit more proactively and a little bit more uh, upfront. Uh, it's a lot about supporting host communities, which tend to live in lagging regions uh, in developing countries. It's also about supporting a shift of policies 
so that refugees can move towards a degree of socioeconomic inclusion. Um, and it's working at both the regional and the, and the country level. Uh, and in terms of the main engagement areas, I mentioned earlier jobs, uh, education, gender, because to me these are really three of the key areas uh, when we talk about um, uh, this agenda. But for the World Bank, it also means uh, engaging into new areas where we have a limited experience, um, uh, such as this humanitarian development uh, complementarity. And, and I just would like to close here by saying that as we do so, um, we really want to do this in partnership with others, including in partnership with others that have been working at it for, at this issue, on these issues for uh, decades. Um, uh, we're trying to enter this with, with lots of humility and definitely with a very strong awareness that we have lots to learn uh, from, uh, from many others, including and, and, and especially from our humanitarian actors. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Xavier, uh, for the presentation. It's been both very informative and also, uh, I would say, thought-provoking. It's also provoked some questions. So I would like to hand the floor over to Melissa for some uh, follow-up questions, both to yourself and to your colleague, Hannah. Over to you, Melissa. Thank you so much, uh, Xavier. That was a very rich presentation. I would like to first ask your colleague if she wouldn't mind, Hannah, she wouldn't mind answering because I know she has to leave in about 10 minutes. And then I have a question for you as well, Xavier. But to Hannah, I want to ask you a question that's come up in every discussion that I've had with NGOs when we're thinking through um, the World Bank's evolving role. And this question has come up from Abrar in Pakistan. He said, is there any possibility for small nonprofits like ours to get access to um, the World Bank funding to implement humanitarian assistance projects. Uh, maybe you could help clarify that because it's an area that uh, seems to be um, one that people are very interested in. Over to you, Hannah. Thank you, Melissa, and thanks for having me uh, on this um, on this dialogue. Uh, as my colleague Javier already mentioned, but let me emphasize here: the World Bank primarily works with governments, and these are not well I mean there seems to be a bit of a misconception about projects in uh, countries normally they're referred to as World Bank funded projects they're not because they're led by governments and they are uh, primarily implemented by implementing agencies and units within uh, these governments so technically they are not World Bank projects okay so as Javier already mentioned the World Bank works with governments and it provides grants or loans to governments, and so we work through these, um, uh, you know, on these government-led agendas. Um, so having said that, uh, I would encourage our colleagues, our NGO colleagues, to engage further with our country offices uh, on the ground to share their experience and knowledge, and um, and and also get a better sense as to how. Some of these projects, in, uh, like for example in Afghanistan and a few of the other FCV uh, countries, where you have third party monitoring uh, as to how uh, CSOs or NGOs uh, work with governments, and again, these are on government projects, uh, as third party monitoring or uh, service providers, so to get a better sense of uh, you know, how this is implemented on the ground by governments. Uh, so that would be my advice, and um, and, and again, uh, let me also just take this opportunity uh, to emphasize what Javier said. It's not just about funding, but we also work with CSOs on policy dialogue, on advocacy-related issues, uh, and we have several platforms and tools where the World Bank engages with civil society organizations, including faith-based organizations, and parliamentarians, um, so I would uh, I would encourage um, people who are plugged in to also visit our website at www.worldbank.org forward slash civil society. Thank you, Hannah, and I know you have to go, but I uh, really appreciate that. And uh, before we move on with our next speaker, Xavier, I I did want to follow that line of thinking when we talked about the, the, the real important role of governments in um, what the World Bank is doing. 
Shabnam from Yemen asks, uh, we work in what he calls a scenario B um, situation uh, where there's limited government leadership, uh, this, the policies aren't sound. Um, what What is the solution when you're working in that kind of context, Xavier? Do you have some thoughts there? Let me maybe start. Um, so thank you, thank you very, very much for your for your question, and once again for your for your interest. And uh, and you know, um, once again, let me just say this is this is many respect a new area for the bank. So um, on lots of these um, uh, on lots of the questions that you're asking yourself, uh, there is not necessarily a, a, an answer, right? So so let me just reflect on on some of the on some of the questions rather than trying to respond to them. So first, first, just to just to explain a little bit what the World Bank does, because I I was yesterday at another event and I felt that there was a little bit of a misperception that essentially we we we're paying governments to build power plants and and big uh, and big highways, and and that's obviously part of what we're doing, but that's only a small part of what we're doing, right? So now when we talk about World Bank finance projects, we're really talking about anything from this large infrastructure to microcredits, to education, to health, to what we call community-driven development. And while it makes a lot of sense when you think about a power plant to basically give money with, with, with obviously some oversight and some you know, uh, institutional arrangements to the power company, which tends to be a big uh, government company, when it comes to microcredit, what you want to do is, is basically just to make sure that the money goes to organizations that have an experience with microcredit for them then to, um, uh, to, 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 to provide or to manage the resources in support of, of, of the poor. Um, and that are typically, you know, the, the Grameen uh, um, uh, 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 Bank, BRAC, and so on. I mean, just, just to refer to, to, the, to the South Asia um, uh, to the South, South Asia context. So these are typically something where we would provide our resources to the, to the, to the authorities, but then the authorities would in turn uh, put it at the disposal of organizations, including civil society organizations, for them to actually work contracted by the government to extend these resources to others. And especially when we talk about false displacement, um, we very often talk about a lot of what I would call soft projects, right? We, we're typically not talking about a large-scale infrastructure, we're talking about smaller uh, 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 stuff. Uh, but as I said earlier, for us, the challenge is partly to build a school, but it's mainly, it's mainly to engage with the government so that the refugee children can actually go to the same school as the others, right? And, and so we really see our financing as a way to support a move by the government in this, in this direction. If I take an example, um, Ethiopia is talking about letting some of the refugees leave out of camps and move to, to the rest of the country to have a, a more normal life. Our financial support is really aimed not so much at building the school or building the hospital or whatever, but at accompanying this movement that to us is what's going to provide refugees with different perspective and different uh, frankly, chances for life. Now, in terms of Yemen, there are indeed a number of countries where the, the, the government-led model is very, very difficult. Uh, now, <clears throat> there's an easy answer to your question. I'm going to, to start with the easy, easy answer, which is that when it comes to forced displacement to refugees, almost by definition, refugees do not live in these countries. Because almost by definition, refugees move from a country that's at war and very fragile to one that's relatively uh, stable. And so in a way, when it comes to uh, uh, refugees and forced displacement, the programs we have are typically not in this category B uh, um, or plan B uh, uh, scenario. So that's the easy answer. Uh, the more complex one is, so what do we do? Uh, how do we engage in such countries? And, and what are we trying to actually uh, uh, achieve in such countries? Uh, one of the ways we've been trying to engage is on a very exceptional basis through UN organization or through um, outfits like ICRC to try and see whether we could save some or preserve some of the development gains uh, even in the middle of a very difficult uh, situation. But as you know, these are engagements that are very young. They started only a year or a year and a half ago. And so I think the, for an organization like ourselves, which really looks more at a three, five, eight year perspective, I think the question is really, 
uh, does it work, or what works, and what works less well, and therefore, how do we think in the next period about how to deal with this Category B government? Thank you, Xavier. We have many, many more questions coming through for you, um, but we'll give you a little break now, and uh, I'll hand back over to Anhara to Thanks take us lot, forward Melissa. in the conversation. So now it is, uh, once again, my pleasure to introduce Lauren Post. Policy and Advocacy Officer with the International Rescue Committee, where she focuses on humanitarian aid policy and reform. Previously, Lauren worked at the Center for Global Development, where she led policy outreach for the Center's Global Health Program and Data Revolution Initiative. Over to you, Lauren, you have the floor. Uh, thanks so much, Anchor and, and Melissa, too, um, you know, for hosting this event and for inviting me uh, to uh, present here, um, it's always, you know, really interesting to see the types of questions coming across, um, you know, as, as this is something we've been engaged in at the IRC for, for about, you know, almost two years now of um, sort of keeping a close eye on, on the bank's engagement. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about, you know, how IRC, um, you know, sort of views some of this World Bank financing, where we're seeing some progress um, and maybe some um, challenges, um, and then share a little bit about, you know, the opportunities that we've found for engaging um, with the World Bank and, and with some of the financing mechanisms that Xavier helpfully um, just laid out. So first here, you know, I think the, the question that we, we were, you know, pose, posing to ourselves was, you know, what is the World Bank's role and, and can it be kind of a game changer? Um, you know, where, we, where we've netted out is, you know, there's a lot of um, potential here. Um, you know, first, there, there's potential from moving from rhetoric to action on the humanitarian development divide. Um, you know, there are really very few development actors that are, you know, really, really engaged on trying to make this a reality. Um, and the bank is, you know, one of the, the leading um, organizations doing this. Really importantly, I think this is new money. It's flexible money. It's money that, you know, can be dispersed over many years, something that we don't really see a lot of in the humanitarian space. The bank also brings a new set of policy relationships, technical expertise, especially when it comes to trying to achieve longer-term goals, um, new opportunities for partnerships, and things that I think we can really leverage together. Um, and finally, you know, given the bank's focus on reducing poverty and socioeconomic issues, um, the bank can really prove to be quite an ally in helping us turn the narrative um, about refugees as, as a crisis or an issue or a problem to refugees as, as an opportunity for development um, and making that case stronger, um, especially in a lot of host countries. So as I said, you know, over the last 18 months or two years, um, IRC has been closely following what the bank's been doing along with uh, some old colleagues um, and friends at the Center for Global Development, which is a think tank here in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, as we sort of watch what the bank is doing um, and try and engage with these new financing facilities, there are a couple of things that I think we, we really wanted to know. Um, you know, one is, is how is the bank working? Um, you know, what new stakeholders and partnerships is it engaging in? Are those working? Are they not? Um, what lessons can we really draw from what they're doing and what they're learning? Um, and, you know, uh, wh whether or not we are actually seeing improvements in the lives of the people we're all trying to um, assist. So overall, I'd say there's been some important progress made. Um, host governments are, you know, really seeing them in, in several countries where, uh, you know, you have bank financing leading on the refugee response. Um, and that's a factor of you know, not just the World Bank, but also you know, the UN's new framework. Um, the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework. Um, we're seeing movement towards the policy commitments that were made back in 2016, both at the Leader Summit and at the Responding to the Syria Region Donors Conference um, that led to a couple of country compacts, the Jordan Compact and the Lebanon Compact. Um, and as I mentioned, I mean, the bank has, you know, in our view, done a pretty good job of partnering with UNHCR, finding new ways of working with them and supporting governments together um, to implement and pilot the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework, uh, particularly in a handful of, of African countries, um, both in the East and West. 
To give you a sense of the type of things that we're seeing changing on the ground, um, I'm just choosing two countries that um, of the handful that we've been really keeping a closer eye on. So we also have found some findings for places like Lebanon and Uganda and are also looking um, at progress in, in Chad and Niger as well. Um, but just to give a sense here, um, so in Jordan, we're, we've seen um, you know, quite an expansion of access for refugees to work permits. Um, there's more types of jobs and more subsectors open to refugees um, to work in. One of the biggest things, you know, policy changes that we've seen thanks to bank financing um, and some new partnerships is that work permits have been delinked from a single employer for the agriculture and construction sectors. Um, and this has had, um, you know, this allows refugees to then have jobs with multiple employers, um, you know, ideally also helps reduce um, some, some of the, the barriers that they were facing um, in country. Um, and then we're seeing some modest, um, modest progress on, in the special economic zones um, that um, essentially there's a, a, a trade deal where, you know, it, uh, with the EU and Jordan, whereby factories working or set up in the special economic zones that are employing a certain number of refugees are able to um, have better trade opportunities with the EU. Um, and, and that's something that's still ongoing and we're seeing some challenges, but there's some modest, modest efforts there. Um, in, in Ethiopia, we're seeing you know, some, some movement on the government's um, promise to review its refugee policy, um, and as Xavier mentioned, expanding its out-of-camp policy specifically. Um, the projects for industrial parks to provide up to 5,000 jobs for refugees is well underway um, and, and hopefully going to start later this fall, as I understand it. Um, and, and critically, there are some improvements to the vital documentation, registration, and data collection efforts um, of, of the country, um, which is obviously really important as, as that can be one of the backbones for success moving forward. That all said, it's not all roses and rainbows, um, and, and while it's still early days, you know, there's still some, you know, some concerns that I think we, we've seen and we've raised these, you know, obviously also with Xavier and his team um, and folks on the ground too. Um, but just to give you a sense of some of the challenges that, you know, I think need to be overcome in order for this financing to have real impact. Um, one is that, you know, we have to make sure that um, and encourage the bank to uh, make sure that its programs are sensitive to um, refugees' unique needs and constraints um, that may be different from the host communities or the populations that the bank typically works with. Um, also need to ensure that you know, the, the lessons that we as humanitarians have learned in delivering services um, to refugees is taken on board um, as part of the solution set that the bank puts forward in these countries. Um, it's really great that you know, the bank is covering a lot of sectors uh, with its programming, um, but at the same time, you know, humanitarians are also covering a lot of different areas too. So we need to really make sure that we're all driving towards the same set of outcomes. Um, so while you know, host country policy commitments might be clear and understood, I think there's still um, some questions about the intended outcomes of, of some of the bank's work. Next on my, my sort of list here is, is consultations and stakeholder engagement. You know, I, I, in speaking with my colleagues on the ground in places like Ethiopia or Jordan or Uganda, you know, it's, it's often really unclear to them and probably to many of the folks online today um, to what extent, you know, consultations are feeding into the World Bank financing process or into the UNHCR's comprehensive refugee response framework process. Um, you know, these two mechanisms have been rolled out over a similar time frame, but it doesn't always appear that they're quite as streamlined as they could be. Um, and, and while there's definitely some good synergies between the bank and UNHCR, it's sometimes unclear how you know, NGOs and civil society and refugees can really engage in these processes um, and, and impact them. And then finally, I obviously would be remiss here you know, as an implementing NGO uh, to not talk about some of the, the protection standards um, you know, and, and accountability to those that, that we're um, keeping a, quite a close eye on. Um, you know, the bank requires host countries have a framework for refugee protection to access these new financing mechanisms. Um, but I think our questions remain, you know, what if the situation on the ground changes between the time that a country becomes eligible 
uh, for financing and the time that you know projects or programs are going back to the board for approval. Um, and I think some place we're seeing this happen right now is is probably Cameroon, where you know there are a lot of questions about the voluntariness of returns um, and. Financing has been approved for Cameroon, and projects are now um, going to the board. Um, so I think keeping a close eye on to see what the board does now um, will be really important for, for lessons moving forward. Um, some of the top line you know, recommendations that IRC and CGD have been sort of putting forward around a lot of this work, um, there's, there's a couple of high-level ones, so I'll share, I'll share those quickly. Um, first is that you know we really need to make sure that the outcomes are well defined, as well as the targets and benchmarks for achieving those um, together um, with humanitarian agencies, um, and it's not just the bank doing its own thing and humanitarians doing their own thing. Um, there needs to be a good understanding of unique uh, the unique needs and constraints that refugees are facing, and making sure that the solutions address those. Stakeholder engagement can be much more streamlined. Um, and probably done a little bit better um, at the country level and at the um, HQ level to ensure that the right folks are at the table for decision making. Um, and finally, that you know, sort of the data and evidence that we're all generating is being pooled together to ensure that um, you know we uh, projects are are well um, well adjusted to refugee contacts. Um, and I know that there is, you know, a, a work in progress right now between the bank and UNHCR to build this data center, which um, I think we are, at least at IRC, are hoping um, is going to help bring some of those things together. Um, and I'll just end here with a couple of ways that IRC has been engaging and sort of how we've been following this and where we think there's opportunity for other folks in the line to engage as well. Um, so, you know, here in D.C. and as well as in Geneva, um, you know, I know that the bank has hosted several NGO consultations and, um, you know, has done a, a pretty good job of trying to get the right folks in the room to get some feedback on what they're doing. Um, the bank, and, and I don't, you know, Zavi didn't really talk to this, but the bank and UNHCR have been doing eligibility missions together um, before countries um, are put to the board for to receive financing. Um, so engaging with them while they're in country can be a good opportunity. There are um, technical working groups, I understand, you know, in the country. Um, I know, you know, there's several in Ethiopia and several in Jordan for sure. Um, and I imagine there are in other contexts too. Um, and I think one of the most important things that we as NGOs can be doing is really monitoring the impact and raising concerns with the bank, um, especially around policy changes that we have been, you know, working against for perhaps many years where leverage could be used or, or finance could be used as a leverage. Um, to, to get some movement on those. Um, you know, as Xavier mentioned, they're quite open to hearing from us, and I think you know, it's an obligation for us to start to raise those um, in, a, in a coherent, cohesive way. Um, and then you know, I think also speaking to one of the questions from the first session, um, there is, you know, as I understand it, some potential for NGOs to become implementing partners for bank-funded, government-led projects. Um, and I know even just last week in Ethiopia that there was a consultation on their employment program, um, you know, with an invitation open to NGOs to come and learn more about the project and what might be um, available to, to us to participate in and, and take on. So I will leave it there, and, and thanks so much. Great. Thank you very much, Lauren. Terrific to get your insights um, on all of these questions. And it was also a great opportunity, as we can see, to, to gather a bit of feedback from, from those who were listening to your presentation. So we've put the polls, um, the results, up here on the screen. And now I'll hand over the floor to Melissa. I know she has at least one uh, follow-up question for you before we move on. Over to you, Melissa. Thanks, Anna, and thank you, Lauren, for your presentation and for your deep analysis. It's very appreciated. Uh, with the poll results, um, it's interesting convergence we see here, and, it, and it's consistent with your presentation. Um, we asked the first question, which of the following risks with the current approach do you think is the most likely to occur? And the second, which of the following risks do you think would have the most serious effect if it frequently occurred? And the majority of poll respondents honed in on the idea that projects do not have clearly defined shared humanitarian and development outcomes. So I would wonder if you wanted to react to that poll result. And then um, a question to you, 
from Yishu in Myanmar. Uh, Yishu asks, uh, what added value could NGOs bring to the table when working with the World Bank? And I know you mentioned already on monitoring, but I wanted to know if you wanted to expand a little bit more about the added value NGOs could bring to the table, recognizing um, the way the World Bank works today. Sure. So Thanks so much, to... Melissa. Um, yeah, these poll, uh, polls are really quite quite fascinating. I think it aligns a lot with, you know, what we've been thinking at the IRC as far as, you know, outcome driven um, or shared outcome driven programming is really going to be critical here. Mm -hmm. And it, it's good to know that that IRC is not alone in this. <laughs> um, I would say that, you know, one of the ways that at least, you know, or the opportunity on the table right now that we see for um, trying to get some level of shared outcomes and targets on the table that uh, could potentially bring together the humanitarian development folks. Um, is through the Global Compact on Refugees. Currently, in the draft of the compact, there is language that uh, suggests UNHCR will put together a process for developing indicators for assessing progress um, towards the goals of, of the framework um, and the compact. Um, I think you know, we, something we've been really pushing for is trying to expand that from not just indicators, but also to targets and benchmarks, um, and also to outcomes. Um, and, and the way that we have sort of envisioned some of this working in a way that would um, somewhat naturally align with the bank is through the Agenda 2030 or the Sustainable Development Goals. So you already have a really great framework. Um, however, uh, you know, the, the Sustainable Development Goals don't really incorporate refugees because um, they are not part of national populations. Um, so governments are not necessarily going to count progress. Um, among refugee populations within their, their efforts towards the SDGs. Um, so that would be my one reflection on, on outcomes there. Um, on added value of NGOs, I think, I think there's a lot we bring to the table, especially you know, some of the insights we've learned over the many, many years of working with these populations um, and, and the solution sets that we've found work and don't work um, that might be different from what the bank is used to. Um, you know, for example, I'll give a small one. Um, you know, there's a health project in Jordan that the bank uh, is financing, um, and we took quite a close look at the project just to see, you know, how it was going to impact refugees, how it was going to impact host communities, what types of interventions it was including, um, and something that came up quite starkly to our health team in Jordan was that mobile clinics wasn't on the list of solutions there. So there was a lot, going to be a lot of investment already you know, into health clinics, but perhaps those are not exactly where refugees are, are based or living. Um, and so you're not really going to end up reaching the populations that you're trying to reach. Um, and raising those types of concerns and, and taking a, a look at, you know, okay, this is what this project at the project level is trying to you know, do or achieve, and here are the interventions. And does that really jive with what we know about you know, reaching, reaching folks that we're working with um, and ensuring that, that those services um, you know, have an impact? Um, and so you know, that was something we raised to, to the bank team. Um, you know, and, and they were like, oh, okay, yeah, like, that's really welcome feedback, and, and let's see if we can make something like that work. So I think that there are these sort of like little, little nuggets of, of opportunity to provide that type of insight and, and experience. Um, and I think you know, also being just very well aware of, of the context and working with different populations um, and the dynamics on the ground and the politics on the ground um, and, and, and the role of government or the lack of the role of government from an NGO perspective is um, quite complementary to, to what the bank is trying to, to achieve. So um, I'd say there's plenty of value add that, that, we, that we have, and I hope uh, the bank sees that too. Thank you, Lauren. That's very reassuring. Uh, I'd like to hand Great. over Thanks to you, Anne Now, our third guest speaker today is Thomas Jepson Lay, the humanitarian director for Save the Children in Somalia. He has spent the last 10 years leading emergency responses in fragile contexts. Notable responses include the setup of cross-line emergency response and the establishment of protection of civilians IDP sites within military UN bases in South Sudan, and the successful famine prevention response in Somalia in 2017. 
In his work, Thomas is actively pushing for a smooth transition from emergency to longer-term recovery, ultimately to integrate with the longer-term resilience and durable solutions agendas within Somalia. Uh, Thomas, you have the floor. Over to you. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody from wherever you're dining in. We're here to, to discuss um, World Bank engagement with the Nexus, and Somalia, I think, is an interesting case study to, to discuss that in, um, given the World Bank's current engagement levels being potentially less than they are in certain other countries due to presumably the debt, uh, and, and Javier's slide earlier, which showed the map of where the World Bank has engaged with in the past or is, is currently looking at, at potential countries for access to funding streams. Somalia was not uh, mentioned on that. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more to that and, and some of the other commitments that we're very pleased to hear about. Uh, to, to take this conversation forward, you, you see my introduction. Um, the context in Somalia, uh, the photo you see there, is, is a, a, a very typical lifestyle and, and a very typical scene that you would see within the pastoralist uh, communities in, in the country and, and pastoralism is the majority of the, the lifestyles, the population and the income comes through that. And it would be a nomadic community doing exactly as you see in the photo here, moving from waterhole to waterhole and they would be doing their, their business and chores and collecting water and then moving on to the next and, and wherever the pasture is, taking the livestock in that direction. Um, however, the, the recent years uh, is a real example of climate change in action. And uh, what we can see is this frequency increasing of droughts. Uh, and the last drought that we are, are currently, hopefully, in the process of, of exiting has been a two-year-long drought, which has, has led to a, a, a very desperate, very vulnerable, very weak population across the country. And as we, we see climate change being the, 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 the wonderful phenomenon that it is, uh, that is resulting in additional uh, sort of polarized responses, polarized weather systems coming in. So having just had two years of drought, the, the communities are now experiencing an awful lot of flooding, the worst flooding in 50 years. So that's a very difficult uh, sort of dynamic to, to, to engage with. But what makes it even harder when it comes to resilience and, and engagement with this nexus is that the, 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 the time frames between these climatic shocks are, are, getting, are getting less and less. So the natural recovery period between them is not sufficient to bounce back under the normal coping mechanisms. Now that places traditional livelihoods and lifestyles at risk and at threat. Uh, and so we've got this sort of future direction that the, the, the context is going in where you've got a youth population in transition, uh, there's a desire across the government, across the youth, the populations, and I think the, the international community for a livelihood diversification approach to be taken there. Um, a, a large number of Somalis that I speak to, a large number of our staff, a large number of the ministries that I've spoken with uh, will admit that pastoralism in its current format uh, doesn't have much of a future. Uh, whether or not it goes into a more commercialized route such as the Ethiopian piece, etc., is yet to be seen. But what we do need to understand is, is what the future opportunities are for the communities there. And, and to give a very simple case study and a little story that I heard, I, I was in one of the, the IDP sites in, in northern Somalia, and I was speaking to an elderly gentleman and his son. His son was, was in his late teens, and he, he was questioning his future. Uh, his father was, was explaining the previous droughts and the pastoralism would be his way forward. But his son was, was asking why and was saying you know, in 2011, he was 11 or 12, he witnessed the last drought, he witnessed the decimation of the income source and he witnessed the struggles to rebuild it only to see it get decimated again. And, and in that period of time, smartphones have become available. The, the mobile telephone communications networks in Somalia are better than, than in London at times. And, and so there's a huge window to the world. That, that is now available to people. So they're questioning the future. Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to pursue uh, a, a default pastoralism, especially when climate is affecting it so much? Now that's led to an awful lot of displacement, an awful, awful lot of migration within the country. Um, we've currently got uh, 2.6 million IDPs just within Somalia itself, let alone refugees that have left. And Javier was mentioning that sort of context piece earlier. 
Now, these individuals, these, these displaced communities, are, have gravitated towards the urban areas, and, and it's a, a trigger, a little flashpoint in the wider urbanization phenomena that is, that is occurring. Uh, but what, what happens? What, what are the options when they get there? And, and there's a huge amount of work going on around the durable solutions. There's a lot of initiatives, a lot of endeavors that are taking place. And the World Bank has engaged in some of those um, through the, the Regional Durable Solutions Secretariat that, that is in place and some of the other plans that, that certain municipalities have got for a longer term answer to IDPs, which is uh, hopefully linked to land rights and the biggest threat to IDPs at the moment is, is evictions, which we need to, to, to address and we need to come up with solutions with. But that needs to be government-led. That is not a humanitarian response. Yet it seems to be humanitarian actors and humanitarian NGOs are the ones who are providing services to these communities. Now, we're doing that in a very archaic fashion. We're looking at IDPs and we're targeting against vulnerability, whereas Potentially, the answer is, is in a, a, an area-based approach and a solution that addresses the geographic piece rather than the individual households and, and disaggregating people based on uh, a, a certain targeting criteria that we really need to, to address. The, the, the way out from that solution, the way out from there, would be uh, increased economies, increased industries, increased infrastructural development and, and answers to some of this land rights issues. Now, the governments have massive plans for these, but they're all conceptual. Um, to, to turn these infrastructural projects, such as water irrigation systems, dams, the transport networks, to turn those into reality, then the, the government needs to have access to financial mechanisms like the IDA 18, uh, which, which is currently not accessible to the government of Somalia because of the debt that they are facing. Now, the World Bank, I know, is very engaged with that conversation, and we welcome the most recent spring meeting outcomes and this uh, commitment made for another 150 million uh, pre-arrears clearance to be provided in addition to last year's 50 million clearance. That shows a real commitment to this process, but if we could fast-track that, then I think we would be able to capitalize on this relatively unique moment in time that we face where um, after decades of, of fragile government, the fragile infrastructure and, and, and an uncertain future. We currently have a government that provides the potential sense of promise, has come in on a, an awful lot of popularity, maintains that popularity within the public, is working through the initial stages of a federalism in the country and, and an engagement and a power sharing between state and federal level authorities, etc. And, and off the, if you take that political environment and then you add on the momentum and the successes that were achieved last year in the drought response and the uh, fact that we did collectively demonstrate what is possible when we all come together as a community uh, and, and prevented a famine. If we can take that momentum and take the, the unique promise that the government is offering now that we've not seen in the past and actually finance that and actually put a bit of faith in, in, in what is possible there then we might be able to turn this around. Now, the World Bank has engaged in, in a series of, sort of government support structures there, uh, particularly of note is the drought impact needs assessment, which was conducted at the end of last year, which is, for those who are familiar with the post-disaster needs assessment framework that exists, this was the Somali equivalent for that. We changed the name because we're not out of the disaster yet, but um, that was a, a very useful exercise to take place that provides an awful lot of detail to, to, to be able to populate the recovery and resilience framework, which is the, hopefully the, the roadmap as to how the government's national development plan can be achieved. Um, however, there, there needs to be uh, another set of um, actions taken forward. We cannot leave it just at these documents and, and the World Bank continued engagement in that with the government is, is going to be critical to see that move forward, especially when it comes to the leadership of this development and this resilience agenda moving forward. It sits with the government, it's housed with them, they have their three pillars under the National Development Plan, and, and if we can ensure, if the World Bank's support to the government can improve the sense of leadership that is given there, then an awful lot of the other uh, development and resilience frameworks, agendas, 
consortia endeavors that are currently underway can all fall into line and, and it would add an awful lot of complementarity into that. Um, and, and this is a, a potential opportunity, I feel, for the bank to, to really take the lead on, on a, a bridging of this divide by, by smoothing this transition from a humanitarian focus in 2017 into a longer term recovery resilience piece in 2018. That would really help, I think, and, and in 10, 20 years time, we would look back on this moment and think, yes, that was the, that was the, the right moment to make this, this switch and the right moment to have that leap of faith in there. But it's moving on, you know, sort of the water system uh, there that, that the World Bank has helped fund. And it was interesting to hear um, Lauren's comments earlier about NGOs becoming direct implementing partners for, uh, for World Bank funding. And NGOs, historically, we're not the natural recipient of, of World Bank funding. We're not structured or set up to be a particular uh, deliverer of a contract for a development bank that exists. Now, it's not to say we don't have experience in that. Save the Children has, over recent years, taken on board $80 million worth of World Bank originated funding, um, and you'll see only 5% of that was, was direct. The so 75% there has come through the, the respective government in, in the country. And of that percentage, there was a, a small, small component that came to, to Somalia last year, and, and the World Bank thankfully funded one of the resilience consortia called BRICS, um, which, which is a, a multitude of NGOs, IRC, is also part of. And, and that is, is, is a consortium that is, is actively trying to bridge this divide as well. And the World Bank contribution there was for a very sustainable water uh, access to safe water solutions. And, and it avoided, thankfully, um, the trap of water trucking. And we were able to really invest in, in solutions for communities that can have long-term impact. And, and speaking to the, the BRICS director recently, the, the, the collective delivery of that particular reward, I think 2.7 million, has seen a huge amount of benefit and a huge amount of the positive change for those communities, far more than some of the other humanitarian related funding streams that we've been delivering so far. Now, if we can take those examples and, and use the, the, the learnings that we've collectively come to through that experience and through the experience of the other 77.3 million around the world um, and, and understand that we are in this, this phase of relationship building between the World Bank and, and NGOs and, and uh, we, we have a, a body of knowledge now within both sort of institutions where, where the World Bank is more familiar with how an NGO operates and, and we are more familiar with what is required when it comes to delivering a contract with a bank rather than an award for a donor and if we can take that into practice that will force the change that I think NGOs need to undertake. Uh, to remain relevant as this sector moves forward, change is inevitable and, and we have to adapt and we have to move with that. So we would welcome this ongoing engagement with, with the bank in this mechanism. And, and as I mentioned earlier, this 150 million pre arrears clearance that was committed to Somalia at the spring meetings would be, would be very welcome to turn into reality uh, as soon as possible to be able to effectively put more uh, very valuable programming into the Somalia response moving forward. The other sort of major angle and, and major component of uh, NGO engagement with the bank um, and Somalia is, is part of that is on the advocacy side. Now, uh, NGOs, we typically love to shout. We love to make a lot of noise about issues that we are very passionate about. But what's been very pleasing and very encouraging to, to take the children is the World Bank's um, ears, the way that you've listened, the way that that, that some of that advocacy has really come and, and been taken forward. Lauren mentioned some, some examples earlier, and, and we've had very great success with the um, World Bank incorporating uh, the education commitments into the Global Refugee Compact, and, and that's very thankful, and we would encourage that that takes forward, uh, is taken forward. The, the other positive direction that, that some of the advocacy that I know for children's leadership has undertaken with the bank is, is on the debt relief for Somalia. And, and thankfully, the rhetoric seems to be that that will occur. Um, and there's a process underway which the government are, are taking very seriously. Now, if we could, could fast track that process, I think it would avoid any sort of stop gap. Uh, in, in the, the, the momentum that we're building in Somalia, as I was mentioning earlier. And so time is, is of the essence there. And if we could have a roadmap 
for that debt relief, that would be that would be excellent. Um, in terms of other sort of future uh, agendas and future opportunities, um, the Somalia offers a perfect opportunity, I think, for the nexus to become a reality. Um, some of the the poll that you mentioned earlier, interestingly, was talking about this disconnect between the humanitarian and the development outcomes, and the fact that there is no common vision for that. Now. I would agree with that in the Somalia context um, when it comes to practicalities. However, there is a conversation and there is a, a series of documents about collective outcomes where we are bringing the development community and the humanitarian community together. Now, we both have to make more effort. Um, as as I have introduced, I, I am very actively trying to do that from, say, the children's perspective, but I'd also encourage the other development actors, if there's anyone on the call, to, to do the same. But also. I'd encourage the bank to maybe step up as a facilitating function in that and, and by promoting the, the, the efforts and the engagement that you've had and the success that you've had with the 50 million drawdown last year and the small piece to the BRICS piece and the 150 that could come forward, see if there's a way that we can utilize that funding mechanism to move this agenda forward. Um, that's uh, kind of all I would, would sort of propose now and, and put forward. I'd, I'd welcome your any questions and comments that anyone might have. Um, but just to, to close, I think this, this little boy's question, having arrived in a stabilization center after experiencing a drought, is what is my future? What, and, and that's what he's asking, and that's what his mother's asking. And I think the answer to that lies in the successful implementation of an access type uh, arrangement where we can support a government and we can provide a, a clear direction on a resilience agenda that, that doesn't take humanitarianism outside it and doesn't leave the humanitarian bit to be acting independently. It needs to be built into the longer term piece and shocks need to be mitigated through uh, the action and incorporated response rather than parallel response. So thank you all very much for listening and uh, look forward to the Q&A yes, session. Yes, absolutely. A big that. thanks to you, Thomas, um, for sharing all of these points from your experience and insights as well. We do have a few minutes left for the Q&A, so we want to move right ahead. I will hand the floor over to Melissa uh, for the Q&A moderation. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so the first two questions, uh, Xavier, if you're still on with us, we would um, pose to you. Um, the first one is about humanitarian principles. Uh, many people submitted questions related to humanitarian principles. And uh, one uh, question was framed by Andy in the UK, who asks, does the World Bank, as an intergovernmental organization, have any advice for humanitarian NGOs on how to handle issues of neutrality? Neutrality when participating in the Nexus type programming and the second question is with regard to the time frame, uh, because we've discussed how development actors can work in a longer time frame than humanitarian. Fatima in Pakistan asks, the pace of humanitarian development work is different. Uh, we experienced this in Pakistan while putting the two streams together in one transition plan that ran from 2018 to 2020. Um, for residual humanitarian needs, we were required to work before the next funding windows. And donors need to be cognizant of this issue and be flexible. And for collective outcomes related to governance, resilience, economic growth, and livelihood coming from development partners, it required more time. So she asked, how shall the twain meet? So over to you, Xavier. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you to um, uh, everybody once again for your, for your engagement on this. Let me let me maybe um, say a few things, and you know, just to keep the the, the conversation lively, may, maybe let me be a bit uh, provocative. The first thing is, you know, I'm sometimes a little bit uncomfortable with this uh, nexus uh, uh, language. I think what we're trying to do is just we're trying to do good, right? Um, so I, I I just don't think that we need to over complexify or over jargonify uh, uh, things. I think we have a number of people who are uh, in distress. Um, we as a World Bank can do some things. We cannot do everything, uh, not at all, right? And a number of you may directors can do other things. And I think the challenge for us is to try to see how we can best make sure that they complement each other. So for example, on the question of neutrality and humanitarian principles, 
I mean, these are, these are fundamental principles that should underpin a number of the things that are happening in, the, in, in a number of, of uh, conflict contexts. And from our perspective, the engagement of the World Bank is once again not in lieu of um, a humanitarian engagement or to kind of substitute it or to kind of replace it with another approach. It's really about complementing it and complementing it in those parts of the world where it is indeed possible to do some development work. And that's not everywhere, right? So um, I, just, I just wanted really to, to, to really reemphasize that we are part of a broader engagement with, with a number um, uh, of actors. And in no way or, 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 or mean do we pretend or do we, um, I mean, I think it would be an absolute disaster if it was seen as, as replacement, as substitution or as undermining what the, what the humanitarians are, uh, are doing. The, the other point, if, if you allow me, Melissa, the other point I briefly wanted to get back to, because it's, it's somewhat linked, is this notion of protection agenda. Uh, the bank, um, uh, basically, is a bank's engagement somewhat uh, risking to, 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 to undermine the protection agenda. So I just wanted to be very, very explicit about that and, and about the fact that for us to engage in a given country, we do, not, we do need to ascertain that the protection framework is adequate, which in, practical, which in very you know, practical terms, we do basically based on a consultation with UNHCR. So we, we really turn to UNHCR to pass a judgment on the protection framework, and that, that defines whether we can engage. Now, it's not adequate protection framework at the time of eligibility. It's adequate protection framework at the time of eligibility and throughout the implementation of our program, which, as we discussed, uh, does, does take time. And at any point of time, we have the, 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 the right and actually the duty um, uh, to react should the, should the protection framework uh, become less than, than adequate. And I think this was pretty much what underpins the discussion that uh, uh, Lorraine referred to uh, when, it came to, uh, when it came to Cameroon. So just wanted to um, uh, also uh, briefly uh, mention that. And I'm happy, of course, to respond to other questions, Diane. Oh, oh, there are, there are many. Um, I really like this question, Xavier, from George in Pakistan, and maybe it's too early or it's not easy to answer, but uh, we always love to get uh, good stories of success. Um, so in your opinion, Xavier, what has been the most successful World, project, World Bank project to date? And he also included the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework. And he also asked for clarification if the mechanisms we're discussing today are for refugee context only or also for IDPs. So the principles of our engagement are for both refugees and IDPs. The financing term, the financing instruments are only for refugees. And you know, just, just, to, just to be very blunt about that, and once again, please don't, don't read anything between the lines, but um, uh, essentially what we're trying to do is to provide additional resources to, re to countries hosting refugees. Now, uh, and you know, in a way, it's a recognition of the effort that they're making. Imagine that we were going to provide additional refugees to countries hosting IDPs. Uh, I think we all agree that there would be some cases where we would actually send a very weird and strange signal to governments that may actually be causing uh, the IDP flows, right? Um, uh, so, that, so there are other ways to, to engage with IDPs, uh, but from our perspective, it's really not about uh, uh, providing uh, um, uh, uh, additional resources is much more about using some of the traditional parts of money that are available and trying to steer them um, in the direction of the IDPs. In terms of success uh, stories, you know, we really are, um, you know, when, when, we, when we work with UNHCR, I keep telling them we're not slow, we're slower. Uh, we're even slower than you think. So uh, uh, we're, not, we're not in the in the model of a kind of a three-month, six-month uh, delivery framework. As I said earlier, we're much more into a three-year, five-year delivery framework because what we really want to do is to help governments uh, uh, in their effort to change policies and to consolidate institutions. And that does take time. Um, uh, and, and frankly, it's not only about changing on paper, it's changing in the reality of life, and that does also uh, take time. So I could talk about, you know, some of our efforts to um, ensure that some of the Syrian refugees in, in Jordan can get work permits, as, as uh, our colleague from IRC was, was referring to. 
uh, uh, I could talk about uh, you know the Ethiopian government adopting last Friday uh, a new proclamation that that basically said define the rights uh, uh, of refugees uh, uh, in the country, but I think it's still a little bit too far. It's a little bit too early uh, for us to um, you know to draw uh, 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 unnuanced uh, responses. I also think that there's a huge issue of attribution in all this. Right, once again, we're part of something which is much bigger. It's only through our collective effort that we will uh, create the change of approach that um, that we all hope to see. So part of it is due to the effort of the World Bank. Part of it is due to the effort of uh, you know all the people on the call here. And I just don't think that we should necessarily take the, uh, the full credit for a number of changes that, um, that we see at play. Okay, Xavier, I want to ask you a bundle of questions uh, related to risk and then turn back to our NGO colleagues. Nana was asking to hear about the World Bank's risk appetite because as you get more involved in fragile contexts, there is going to be more risk attributed. And Gareth followed that up by asking, how can NGOs support the World Bank in mitigating risk? And finally, from Osman, what concrete accountability mechanism does the World Bank have to monitor its resources in places where the corruption is too high? Over to you. Um, so in terms of risk, I think the overall uh, general sense is that uh, the mere fact that we're engaging in, in this uh, sort of topic and sort of areas uh, that shows that we are willing to take a degree of risk. At the same time, uh, we want to take what we call informed risks, and we also uh, want to manage them. Now, there are a number of risks when we talk about this sort of things, right? There are security risks, there are reputational risks, and there are the most important risk, which is the risk that uh, our engagement does not yield um, uh, what we hope it does. Um, and so I think the the answer uh, to the question is very, therefore a very nuanced answer. Uh, in principle, we, we're very keen on taking some risk, informed risk. And in principle, we very much realize that this requires working with others and really, as, as uh, the question suggested, uh, uh, learning from civil society, but also trying to partner with civil society. How does this, how, what does it mean in practice? Would obviously be a function of the context and a function of the um, uh, of the operation. In terms of the accountability mechanism, if you if you allow me, I just I just would like to take uh, uh, one minute to to take you through the the, the 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 sort of stuff we do. So imagine you know circumstances where the World Bank would provide uh, relatively large amounts of money to a government. Uh, to say build schools, right? Uh, in principle, what, it, what we would do is that, in most cases, and obviously everything, every case is different, but in principle what we would do is that we would ask the government to appoint um, a, ded a dedicated team of people clearly identified um, uh, we, to essentially manage the resources. We would then provide these people with uh, training on, on how to, to, we want things to be done. Uh, for each contract um, that they pass before, and, and you know, these are contracts that are, we would insist that, or we do insist that they are competitively bid. And for each contract before they are competitively bid, they have to provide us with, uh, uh, you know, with basically the bidding documents, and we have to respond and, and confirm that they are uh, okay with us. Once they have received uh, firms, once um, uh, they have prepared a, f a list of firms that are qualified, they have to send us this list and to explain to us the process by which they've, they've arrived to this, to this list, and we have to confirm that this is indeed uh, acceptable to us. Once they have selected a firm, once again, they have to get back to us uh, detailing the process that they followed, and we have to confirm that this is okay with us. We would also typically insist on the fact that you take an engineering firm, which is an independent firm, also competitively selected to the same process uh, uh, to, monitor, uh, uh, to monitor things. And we would like, in most cases, to ask that the report of this uh, engineering firm are, are also copied to us. And on the top of that, we typically would ask for an annual audit by you know, a reputable uh, firm to be done at least on an annual basis. So this is not an entirely foolproof system. And, and there are, of course, uh, uh, cases where, uh, where we're facing corruption issues. We actually have a dedicated unit to this, uh, for, for this, which is called INT, and which uh, any of you can uh, contact if you see or if you suspect uh, corruption on a World Bank-funded uh, funded project, 
but it's a very t it's a it's a fairly tight some people would say heavily bureaucratized uh, but it's a, it's a it's a it's a fairly tight uh, system of control which is also part of the reason why um, you know things take uh, uh, a little bit of time so I just wanted to use this as an example uh, to say that when we provide money to governments um, it's not it's not blind and it comes to uh, uh, it comes with a number of obligations thank you Xavier um, now I'd like to pose the same question to Lauren, then Thomas, then Xavier, um, because we received so many questions um, and there's such an appetite to learn, um, the, it would be nice to spend just a few minutes on uh, where are the spaces to have a continued conversation. So the question comes from Barris. Where are the fora or the spaces where humanitarian actors from all sectors, including business and finance, work together to increase mutual understanding and constructively align the agendas with civil society, including thought leaders, as well as operational NGOs who work across the continuum. Uh, where is that place that we can have that conversation from your experiences? So I would like to first turn to Lauren and then Thomas and then Xavier. Lauren, over to you. Uh, thanks. Melissa, um, I think, you know, it's, it's a question that we at IRC also, you know, sometimes grapple with as well, um, you know, from the start of our efforts um, in looking at sort of long-term solutions in protracted displacement settings um, and, and the World Bank's entree into, into this arena, um, you know, stakeholder engagement and fora has been um, one of, you know, the top three things that I think we've been trying to figure out. Um, you know, how to do it best, where are our best practices coming from, um, how do you really get the right decision makers at the table um, on a, you know, regular cadence, um, perhaps in some standardized way. Um, right now, I think in the experience that I've seen so far, things can be quite ad hoc. You know, you have different time frames in different countries for different processes. Um, you have a, a comprehensive refugee response framework in some countries um, that do have specific fora for engagement um, that allegedly include um, NGO representation on them. And I think the private sector or business piece of that is yet to be really realized in a lot of these contexts. Um, but we are seeing some civil society engagement there at least. At the same time, you might have you know, the World Bank uh, come in, maybe with UNHCR, maybe on its own. Um, to do, you know, some level of consultation um, on the ground in countries around the financing that they're bringing. Um, you know, for example, in Ethiopia, they have, you know, their own working group around what's considered the jobs compact. But the linkages between, you know, what that working group is um, and then the working group of the CRRS, um, it's, it's rather unclear, you know, how these two are going to link up. Will one fold into the other at some point? Um, you know, what level of alignment and who actually is at the table in these meetings and is it the same people? Um, so I think it's something that we, we certainly are struggling to, to figure out. Um, I think that if we can find a way for this to become a more standard practice um, and find a really good model that might be able, you know, to set the groundwork in many of these contexts, we would be in a much better place. So I know that doesn't quite answer the question of where um, or how um, in, you know, a variety of contexts, but I think it is something that, that needs to um, potentially be figured out in context by context, but I think there are also some things we can do, you know, from here in Washington or in Geneva, um, you know, conversations, um, you know, amongst NGOs and through coalitions to get aligned with the bank. Um, and that does happen, again, a little bit on an ad hoc basis, but, um, you know, I think We've, we've done a fair amount of consultation um, here, here in D.C. Um, that Xavier probably could also, also speak to. Thank you, Lauren. How about Thomas, from your perspective, uh, where do you see the spaces? Uh, I think it's, it's an excellent question, and I think in, in an awful lot of fragile states, it's essentially the long-term answer, isn't it? The, the PPP bit, the public-private partnerships, um, and, uh, Lauren briefly mentioned it. I think that's that's something that as a, an NGO community, we, we don't do enough in. We need to explore and we need to be more comfortable with that. Um, in terms of a, a specific space for it, 
I'd like to go. I'd like to go local on that one uh, as, a, as an offer, as a suggestion out there for discussion on the table. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a concept um, being discussed and, and hopefully actioned imminently in um, one of the major towns in southern Somalia, Baidoa, where the municipal authorities want to, to try and sort of provide a solution to the IDP situation by allocating new land. Now, that one, one way of doing that would be the traditional international community NGO delivered IDP site, right, where we go in and it's all demarcated and we do the shelter provision, et cetera, et cetera. Another way of doing that um, would be to have it as, as a formal suburb of, of the city and uh, a way that's led by the municipality authorities the, that new business can start up and that we, as a new district, it needs all the services put into place. So is there opportunity there for the, the, the private sector to come in and invest and, and generate jobs within the, the, that little community, that little setup, um, of which the, the NGO community could be part of that facilitation. We could be doing the small business loans to help those start up, maybe. Uh, and then you can also, as a, another alternative, add the localization agenda and to the grand bargain into this. And if we realize that into a, a, a improved engagement with civil society in a fragile context and look to try and support them through not a, a, a sort of contractual way but through a, a, a technical support and or support the governance structures with a clear timeline and exit from, from the, the context and hand over to them. That would be another way to be able to engage and, and provide a space for local actors to, to support. Now, World Bank can be part of the facilitation of that through a, a bigger level, top-down approach to enabling some of these um, spaces to occur through the government and the government to be able to facilitate that conversation and uh, everybody takes the lead from them. Um, that's applicable in fragile states and not necessarily something that, that would work through the... Uh, oh, what's that? There we go. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, and thanks for mentioning localization. We definitely want to come to your part of the world with the grand bargain with some of the work we're going to be doing in the future. Um, I'd like to finalize our Q&A um, by turning to Xavier if you have any thoughts on um, spaces for conversations that include civil society. And then I'll leave uh, the rest of facilitation in your good hands with Angharad. So over to you, Xavier. Well, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I think it's an excellent question. Uh, you know, the easy answer would be here. Uh, precisely in the sort of conversation that, 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 that we're having. Um, I mean, like, um, uh, like others before, I think, I, I think there are two levels uh, for, for, for this conversation. One is the local level, um, and I think the colleagues from Save the Children was, uh, uh, was providing some interesting avenues to that. I also think, to be very straightforward, that we do come to this uh, partnership with very different perspective, with very different even language. I mean, we don't use the same words to mean necessarily the same thing. And so I think there's huge scope to kind of uh, learn from each other and try to evolve a common understanding of what we're trying to do. Um, I would very much uh, uh, encourage ICFI to continue to, to play such a role. We're definitely uh, willing to engage even for much longer sessions uh, uh, than this one if it is what it takes because I think it is important that we uh, gradually uh, understand what both sides of the equations uh, can offer and how we can work together. So. Um, even if we wanted to, to sing in terms of a full day thing or, you know, something similar. Um, and I'm, I'm obviously uh, uh, I'm not the master of the, of the technicality of arranging such things, but I do believe that it, it could be time very well spent and that we would be very uh, delighted to contribute. Yeah, excellent. Thanks so much, Xavier, and thanks to all of our speakers. It's been a fascinating, very useful discussion. We have had a huge number of questions coming in that we simply won't have time to address in the short time allotted for the event today. However, as we normally do, we will be following up after the event um, to work with our speakers to try to uh, get a number of additional questions answered so that we can have those as resources uh, for all of you in the post-event follow-up. Speaking of which, the recordings 
of today's event and all of the resources that have been mentioned throughout the discussion uh, and in the chat will be available within the next few days on the event website and you'll receive an email notification when those are ready. Once the transcript of the recording is translated, there will also be subtitles available in both French and Arabic. Furthermore, ICFA will be putting together a briefing paper highlighting key takeaways from today's discussions. Again, we'll be sending out a notification when that is ready for download. And then looking ahead um, in this series, on the 8th of June, the next session on the Humanitarian Development Peace Nexus will address the UN reforms that are currently being rolled out in relation to the so-called nexus and what this means for NGOs and other non-UN actors. We will be hearing from, among others, the UN Resident Coordinator in Mauritania, as well as CARE International's Humanitarian Policy Advisor. You can already register for this upcoming event by clicking on the banner currently on the screen. In addition, on the 19th of July, the session on Humanitarian Development Peace Nexus will explore how peace actors see their role um, in these relationships, including both what humanitarian and development actors can learn from peace building and how peace building efforts can better work towards shared outcomes with other actors. We'll be hearing from the Director General of Interpeace, among other guest speakers. And again, you can already register for the July events by clicking on the banner. So with that, I'll thank once again um, all of our speakers today, my co-host Melissa Patati from ICFA, um, all of the staff teams behind the scenes at both PHAP and ICFA for their hard work leading up to this discussion, and last but certainly not least, the hundreds of participants we had joining the discussion today for their proactive involvement and the very interesting questions. Um, we warmly invite you all to complete the post-event survey to help us continue to improve this series and future series, and we hope to see you next time. So with that, I'm Inherit Lang, once again signing off from Geneva, wishing you all a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.